Good morning, good afternoon, <clears throat> good evening, whatever time it may be, wherever you are tuning in today. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar, An Employment Specialist Guide to Great Hiring. My name is Emily Sandilands. I am Zingtrain's community builder, and I'm thrilled to be here alongside our two presenters today. Um, we have Paul Sweeney, who is our HR generalist and an employment specialist at Zingerman's Department for People. Hi, Paul. Hi, Emily. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, we also have Joni Hales. Joni is one of our fabulous trainers here at Zingtrain. Hi, Joni. Hi, Emily. We are going to dive into uh, content here very shortly. We also have Mara Ferguson here. She is behind the scenes. She is going to be monitoring the chat and the questions with me, so you'll see her in the chat box. Uh, we are coming to you live from all over Ann Arbor, all across the Zingerman's community of businesses, but we would love to hear where you're turning in from. So if you don't mind dropping your location there by navigating to the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, let's do a roll call and see where folks are coming from. Hey, Texas, Phoenix, Hong Kong, wow, India. Great, this is oh. a global webinar. This is so exciting, thank you so much. Keep those coming in, we love to look over those as we continue. We are going to dive into the good stuff here very, very soon. But before we do that, I'd love to go through a little housekeeping. As far as the format for today's webinar, we're gonna be presenting here for a bit and then we're gonna leave some time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. Um, feel free to submit any questions that you have by navigating to the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're gonna to try to get to as many of your questions as we can. If we don't get to your question during the Q&A, we will get back to you with answers in the days to come. There is closed captioning available during today's presentation. And if you'd like to turn that on, you can navigate to the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says CC, the closed captioning button. You can view captions on screen by clicking show subtitles, or you can see the full live transcript of today's presentation by clicking view full transcript. The transcript should pop up to the right of your screen there. Last item of business is that we are recording today's presentation and we will be sending it out to you here in the days to come as well as posting it in our library at zingtrain.com where it will live for all of time. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Joni, to get us started. Thank you so much, Emily. It's really exciting to be here with you all. Uh, as Emily said, I'm Joni and I'm a trainer at Zing Train. I celebrated my 18th year at Zingerman's last summer. Before I was a trainer, I worked at Zingerman's Roadhouse, one of our restaurants, first as a frontline employee hired from one of our job fairs and then became an assistant restaurant manager who had no experience managing people, let alone hiring people. But I quickly found myself as the hiring manager. And many, many years ago, it was definitely a different time for hiring back then. But even back then and still today, I feel very lucky that as when I became the hiring manager, I was actually taught what it meant to hire people well. And I wasn't just expected to know it all. And that we actually had these really great resources that would teach someone who was hiring a new employee how to do that the Zingerman's way. And I did not get the privilege of working with our special guest, Paul Sweeney, when I was the hiring manager, but I know that many of our hiring managers now could not do what they do without him. So before I officially turn it over to him to get to kind of our conversation started around hiring, I just want to ask you all, how have things been going in terms of hiring in the past year? And specifically, if you will type into the chat, what has been the biggest hiring challenge you faced in 2021? Go ahead and type it into the chat. Turn over. I don't think this, any of these will be a surprise to any of us, but let's just see. Let's see what we have in common here. So I'm seeing turnover, getting workers period consistency, a small pool of applicants. Uh, if, we, if I could see you all, I would ask you all to raise your hands if you also face that and probably have a lot of hands up there. Uncertainty, instability, no applicants, follow through with the interviews, yeah, the no applicants, salary wage negotiations, committed candidates, I'm assuming not always the most committed candidates, longevity, ghosting, uh, having to switch to virtual interviews, finding applicants that are quality, the minimum wage. I mean, okay, so lots and lots of things. 
we ask this not because we can solve everything, especially in the time that we have together in this webinar. I don't know about you, but I take a deep comfort in just knowing that we aren't alone. And I, you know, of course, anecdotally, uh, we know everyone has had trouble getting applicants, but just to see so many people writing it, again, we aren't alone. Yeah, the first time in 17 years having the first ghosting. And as I said, we don't have this magic pill or one answer to solve it, but I really do believe that we have some great tools that help make it easy. And with that, I would love to turn things over to you, Paul. Thanks so much, Joni. Yeah, uh, seeing these, I totally agree that it makes me feel a little bit better because I know we've experienced this. No, you are not alone in this. Um, it, it is really um, heartening to see that everyone is struggling together. We're all struggling together. Um, hopefully today uh, you'll learn a little bit about um, things that work for us here at Zingerman's and, and how we do our recruiting here at Zingerman's and, and hopefully you'll, you'll take something away that's gonna be helpful to you. Um, I'll share too that I love having conversations with other people that are hiring. Um, so maybe at the end of this, we'll be sure to post my contact information. I'd love to hear from folks as well. Um, okay, let's jump into this. I'm gonna start with a quote from our founder, Aria Weinzweig. Um, it's, it's something that I do in all of my trainings here at Zingerman's. And it's just to emphasize how important people are in, in any organization. And so the people who make up Zimmerman's community of businesses are the foundation upon which the ultimate success of our organization rests, right? Without great people, we can't deliver great products. We can't deliver great services. So in many ways, a hiring decision is the most important action or decision that a hiring manager is going to make. Um, besides that, there's also some financial impacts to bad hiring. Right. Um, it depends on, there's many different sources on this, but um, estimates range anywhere from 20% to 50% of some salary is what it costs to replace them. So if you extrapolate uh, someone who makes $15 an hour, uh, that means they make around $32,000 a year. It's going to cost you somewhere around $6,000 to $15,000 to replace that person who's fully trained. Um, and that includes the time it takes to hire someone, you know, post a job, all that. Um, the time it takes to train someone. If you make a bad hiring decision, it's performance management of that person. And then there's, of course, the most expensive costs. Uh, if you do something illegal, um, you know, someone sues you because of a discriminatory or what they feel like is a discriminatory practice. So doing this right is really, really important. Moving on uh, to diversity. Uh, diversity is something that we really emphasize here at Singerman's. And uh, you know, ultimately, having a diverse workforce means that you're going to have the opportunity to make better decisions. Um, you're going to have uh, more diversity in sort of opinions. You can innovate. Um, the other thing that I've really noticed over the last year is I've had more candidates ask very pointed questions about um, diversity, you know, what does diversity mean in your organization? You know, I had someone recently who asked for, they wanted like specific demographic information about the makeup of our employee base, which is interesting. Um, so more and more diversity is a key um, to your business and certainly should be part of your hiring practices. Um, we like to emphasize sort of bias awareness. We know that everyone has biases, big and small, um, when they are making uh, decisions on hiring. Um, I've listed a few here that don't always come to mind. Things like bias about an address, that might mean that um, you've hired someone before from this neighborhood, or you make the assumption that, oh, that's too far of a commute, that's not gonna work out. Uh, we wanna give people a chance and, and not um, eliminate people just based on where they live. Uh, names, I like to tell the story of a colleague I had who told me, I will not hire this person because their name is Beth and my ex-girlfriend is Beth and she was crazy. Um, so that's an interesting bias that that person had. Um, writing skills will come up. It depends on the position you're posting for. Sometimes, of course, writing skills are really important. Um, but if it's a job, like for us, we'll hire someone to bust tables. If they have grammatical errors in their cover letter, that isn't a good reason for us to eliminate them as a candidate because that those writing skills probably won't come into play um, when um, they're doing their work. And then first impressions, 
what I want to say about that is that obviously, you know, first impressions are a big part of an interview process. Um, but what we teach people is that you should also have some grace with folks. Like when they come in for an interview, they're nervous, right? So have some grace on that first impression. Allow a candidate time to recover um, if they're nervous at the beginning. All right. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Paul. The monitor that I was sharing the slides on just stopped for a moment. Oh. Uh, so I'm going to get those slides back up. Okay. Everyone just bears with me for one moment. I will do that. So thank you. How does that look to everyone? Great. I see it. Let's see. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the hiring process. Great. Uh, so four stages of the hiring process. Um, and they're all important. I, I might say that the first um, stage is, is the most important and that's the job description. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, next, of course, comes the recruiting process where you're posting jobs um, and getting candidates. Uh, the interview process is of course critical. And then the fun part, or what I see as the fun part is making the job offer to that candidate that you're gonna bring in. So we'll talk about each of those four stages as we move forward here. Uh, the first one is the job description. If you could go back one. Uh, there, there we go, go right? Uh, yep, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for bearing with us. <laughs> uh, so the job description, really, I think of the job description as the foundation of the entire hiring process and not just the hiring process, but their employment with you after the hiring process, right? So in the hiring process, the job description is sort of your job posting. It's the advertisement for your job. It explains what someone can expect um, as they apply for this job. Um, it also is the foundation for how you're gonna train that person once they are hired into your organization because it you know, lists what they need to be doing and you're gonna train them so um, they can do the job well. And then on sort of the more it doesn't have to be negative, I was going to say on the more negative side, but also for performance evaluations, uh, performance management, it's what you're going to rely on to go back to, um, to make sure that the expectations were clear. And if someone isn't living up to um, what they need to be doing in the job, or I guess if they're doing a really great job, you're going to compare that to what was listed on the job description. Um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. I just want to say, I think it is really, really critical that Anytime you post a job, it's a good time to just recheck that job description and ensure that everything is still accurate. Um, so what's included on a job description? And, and certainly each company is a little bit different. This is sort of a listing of what we at Zingerman's include on all of our jobs. The one thing that I probably should have added to this slide is um, the job title. Uh, that would be part of the summary of the job. Um, I'd encourage people not to get too creative with job titles, especially right now where it's where um, candidates are sort of scarce or more scarce than they used to be. Um, having a job title that matches what someone might search for on the internet is more important than usual. Um, you know, it's all fine and good to have crazy fun job titles like director of fun and wonderfulness, um, but it's gonna be hard to find candidates if you've got a real unique job title. Um, Otherwise, candidates are most interested in sort of that first part, the summary of the job. They want to know if it's full-time, part-time, is it salaried, what is the pay? Uh, I would really encourage you to share the pay from the very beginning. Um, we like to be transparent with what we pay folks. And let's be honest, you know, if you've ever looked for a job, you want to know what the job pays. Um, so I'd encourage you to include that. Uh, and then shifts availability. When do you want someone to work? So, so this is sort of the what is it. Um, when is it and what will I be paid, right, is the, is the first section. Within the performance expectations, the most important part is the essential functions. Um, you want to be able to communicate exactly what someone needs to be able to do to do this job well. The non-essential functions are nice. I would look at it sometimes as almost like a marketing opportunity when you're posting a job. Um, it's a chance to list um, other opportunities within the job. Um, I'd also really encourage you to look at the physical demands and make sure that, that they're accurate. Um, I'll just share a quick story here. We were posting a job for um, an accounting position and in the physical demands, 
we said must be able to lift a 50 pound box. Um, and that seems sort of strange. And, and so as we started to look into this, basically our accountants occasionally take boxes full of I don't know, invoices and such, and they'll go and put it in storage and they have to put it in a box and they, and they estimate at one time that was 50 pounds. Um, so we decided to go and let's weigh those boxes and make sure that's right. And it turns out they weigh more like 20 pounds. And that's a big difference. And, you know, that may be the difference between someone who doesn't have a lot of upper body strength, um, decided I'm not going to apply for this job um, or someone applying for the job. So making sure those are accurate is going to ensure that you get as many candidates as possible, right? Um, under desired skills, experience, it's really important to uh, differentiate between what is required and what is preferred. Make sure those are accurate. Again, we don't want to include barriers for applying for the job that don't really exist, right? If a college degree is not really necessary, consider putting that into the preferred category. If there's if there is like a contractual obligation for someone to be let's say certified in a certain way and that is a requirement make that real clear um, that it is required and then finally the desired personal characteristics i'll say this one can be a slippery slope um, you need to make sure that even though these are personal characteristics and personality traits they need to be job related um, so examples here might be um, has um, a, a positive uh, demeanor in interactions with customers, right? So that's sort of a personality trait. Um, they're sort of positive, um, but it's real easy to, to sort of get off and get into things that aren't necessarily necessary for the job. So I'll just say, be a little bit careful with desired personal characteristics. Paul, can I ask you a question about yes, that? Please. I know you work with a lot of the hiring managers in the businesses who I think it can be easy at times to put in personality traits that aren't specific to the job. How yes. do you help coach a hiring manager out of that? Like, What is well, some advice that you give or examples that you can give? Well, I like to ask questions about, is this necessary for the job? And it's also a place where we can say, is this a bias that you have? Mm -hmm. Like you like people that are really well read. Is, is one that I coached someone on not too long ago. Um, I think we, we had listed must enjoy reading in the personality traits. And that was a little bit hard. You know, it's, that's a nice to have, yeah. but I think what they were getting, what they were really getting to is, is this person interested in developing, right? Uh -huh. Are they willing to develop? Um, so sometimes it's rephrasing things in a more um, inclusive way. Okay. Oh, I thanks like that. Asking. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for asking that's, that question. That's a great example too. So thank you. Sure. Okay. So that's the job description. The next phase is the recruiting phase. And this slide is sharing what we usually do for our jobs. Uh, we'll post our jobs on many free websites like Indeed. Um, I'm sure most of you use Indeed. Um, they own probably at least 60% of the market when it comes to sourcing candidates. Um, but other job uh, search engines, we use a system called eQuest, which is an artificial intelligence program that actually scrapes our job descriptions. And based on the content of the job description, it will post it to sort of various niche job boards. Um, and so that's sort of an interesting process. Uh, we'll also use paid websites from time to time. LinkedIn, of course, you can use for free as well. We'll use it for sort of professional level positions where we want to uh, raise the profile a bit. And so we'll sometimes pay um, to um, get a greater reach on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd also encourage you to use professional membership groups um, and you can always use paid postings on other job boards. And Indeed's another example where you can you know, boost, boost the visibility of your um, job posting if you wanna put a little bit more money behind it. Um, uh, other recruiting, I think job fairs, job fairs are interesting because they're, I, I find them to be hit or miss. Um, a lot of times though, it's the vendors or other sort of recruiting people at job fairs that I connect with that pay off down the line. Um, so I think they're worth going to. I'd encourage you to go to, to job fairs. Um, connections with different community resources, colleges, 
Um, we try to, because we're in the food business, we try to connect with culinary programs as well. Um, I, you know, I'm finding more and more in our industry, you know, we had a lot of people leave during the pandemic. And so I'm trying to reconnect with high schools as well and just um, find a way to introduce ourselves to them. Hi, Joni, I see our slides went away. I know there was a glitch and so I'm restarting them. Okay. Uh, and that's someone I'll make sure that everyone can see it properly. So I'm so sorry. You all sure. are so kind to bear with us while we get them back up and for letting us know. I really appreciate that when people tell us there's a glitch in what it is that we are doing. So give me just one moment. Tony, do you think maybe we could ask some questions? Oh, I would love that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, let's let's ask some questions here. We got a lot of great questions in the queue. Um, how do you, uh, we have a question, uh, how do you define diversity? Well, you know, diversity can be defined a lot of different ways, certainly. Um, I don't know that I have a good, quick definition off the top of my head that we use, uh, but diversity, I think, is more about sort of the diversity of thought and experiences that, that one brings to the table. I think for a long time, diversity was simply sort of gender and ethnic diversity and it's really expanded past well past that and much more into what um, experiences come to the table we're going to talk about this a little bit later in culture fit versus culture add um, so i guess i don't have a great definition that i could share other than to say that um, i would i would think about experiential diversity and um, sort of talent diversity over any other kind of diversity Great. How are we doing, Joni? On good. Are I'm we back. Still, okay. I'm are we, back. We're back on. Okay. Yes. Great. How does that look? It is yeah. on. Great. All right. We're on. All right. Paul. So, so we are on. Let's see. If we could go back one slide to slide eight, I'll just finish up the recruiting process. We also use. Um, Social media can be a great source, um, and I would I would encourage you in your marketing efforts to include you know not only are we trying to get customers with our social media posts, but we're also trying to attract candidates. Um, so kind of keep that audience in mind as you post on social media. Um, of course, old school methods work well as posting flyers, having uh, business cards in your businesses. Um, last year at Zingerman's, we hired exactly one thousand and seven people. Um, Two of those people were directly hired because they saw a yard sign in my front yard and told me about it. So it's kind of nice for me to be able to say that I know that 0.2% of everyone we hired was all me. It was all, all me. Um, so my point in sharing that is old school methods sometimes work. Um, and of course, communicate job openings with, their staff, with your staff. Not only do they know people, they know what it's like to work at your organization. Right, they know um, people that might be great fits for your business. So making sure that you really utilize your staff as um, recruiting agents for your business is super important. Did we do any referral program bonuses? I know in the past we have. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a business by business decision okay. within Zingerman. So some of our businesses do specific referral bon bonuses. Um, you know, sometimes staff are not so much motivated by the, you know, $100 bonus that you might want to throw their way. They're motivated to just get more great people with them, especially in this day and age where, you know, places have been short staffed from time to time, and that can be really stressful. Yeah. Ready to talk about the interview process? I sure am. Awesome. So the next stage is the interview process, of course. And our first bullet is stay legal. Uh, you know, I could spend probably an hour talking about legal compliance issues, and it's, it's really not the focus of this. What I will say is that it's critically important that your hiring managers have been properly trained on what is legal and what is not legal in the interview process, um, because it can be a great risk to your organization if you ever get sued, if someone makes a mistake. Um, so um, keep that top of mind, even though it's not something we're going to cover in depth today. Um, you should also make sure you document your interview questions. Uh, we want to ask everyone the same set of questions. It doesn't mean you can't ask follow-up questions that would differ based on their response, 
but you want to have a written guide as you go into any interview and record a little bit of notes and, and keep those um, tucked away someplace um, just in case you need to refer back to them, either for what I mentioned earlier, if there's a legal situation, but also just for your decision making um, process as well. Uh, the other note here is ensure they're job related. Um, make sure that you're not asking questions that kind of get you away from the job itself. That helps you stay legal as well. <laughs> it sure does. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really where you get into trouble is is it's the best intentions. You ask a question that yeah. gets into someone's personal business and can get you in trouble. Uh, you want to make sure you're considering multiple candidates. And if you can't have multiple exposures to each person, uh, so that might include a phone interview it might include maybe a panel of, of people um, interviewing with you so you can get different perspectives. Um, and you can also include the next bullet, which is uh, some sort of a performance test or a role play. Um, we'll do shadow shifts a lot here at, at Zingerman's where they actually come in and see the job and, and stick with someone who's doing the job so they can understand it. You know, because an interview is not only you making a decision about the candidate, but it's the candidate making a decision about you. And you want them to have a good understanding of what the job is going to be like. Um, reference checks. I, honestly, I don't find reference checks super helpful in a lot of cases, mostly because I don't know about you, but when I've listed people as a reference, I know they're going to say good things about me. That's why I've listed them as a reference. So as a hiring manager, you often don't learn a lot of new information. I think they're especially useful if you are truly tied between two candidates and can't quite make a decision. Um, a reference check can help you sometimes. Um, it also, if there's um, you know, certain positions like, um, you know, I think of accounting positions in particular that I, I wanna know a little bit more about their past history um, then I'll, I'll probably do a reference check in that situation. Uh, notifications, make sure you're notifying your, your candidates. And this leads into the last one that, you know, candidates need to get great service just like guests in your organization. Um, think of recruiting as customer service. Um, make sure that you're notifying people whether they got the job or not. Um, and just always keep great service in mind. Um, as you're moving forward. Sorry, I want to say one more thing about notification. In this day and age where you're not getting the number of candidates that you once did, keep in mind that if someone applies for your job, they've also applied for three or four other jobs. And sometimes, depending on the job, first one in is going to win. First person to contact them is going to win. And um, you know, in some of our positions, we've really emphasized that and we've seen that pay off that, you know, it's, it's amazing to get an application from someone and like call them on the phone 10 minutes later. It's incredible. And it makes them believe in you and makes them want to work for you right from the get go. So that's it a really story. nicely into great service to them. Absolutely. It, is. Well. I mean, it keeps both of them. That's great. Um, the interview questions. So we're sharing here a few of uh, these are all interview questions that come from different uh, interview guys within Zingerman's. Um, what I'd like to emphasize rather than reading all of these I, is that this is a mix of both subjective and objective questions, right? Um, a subjective question is a chance for you to sort of get to know someone a little bit better. An objective question should move you closer to a hiring decision. So like the second one, asking about the schedule or explaining the schedule for the posi position asking if they can meet those requirements. That's sort of a yes or no, right? If it's no, then you can move on. So that's a great probably phone interview question for someone. Uh, so you can figure out if, if they are gonna qualify, if they're gonna work out. Um, anytime you ask any question in a job interview, the goal is to get closer to a hiring decision, right? So as you examine your interview questions, what you should ask yourself is, does this help clarify or does this help make me make my decision? And if it doesn't, it's a good one to eliminate from your, from your um, screening questions. Um, yes, I think that's all I wanna say on this one. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you. So I mentioned this earlier, culture fit versus culture add. Um, I think it's a really important uh, determination. 
And you don't have to do this consistently, right? It depends on the makeup of your team. So first, some definitions. Culture fit is someone who fits in with the current uh, culture at your organization, right? And a culture add is someone who's going to add to the current culture that you have in place. So let's say I've got a team of people that are just, they gel so well together. They, they're they great. They work great together. We're like a fine oiled machine, right? And, and we've got a vacancy. I probably want to hire for a culture fit because I don't want to upset the apple cart. I want to keep this baby rolling, right? In another case, maybe I've got a team that I don't know, they're, they've gotten complacent and I could use something to kind of shake it up or I need a specific skill set. Um, then I'm kind of looking for a culture add. I need someone who's going to add or sort of um, be a differentiator in my workplace. Um, and sometimes you find that person who's both, right? And that's that's the probably the perfect person. They fit in with our current culture, but they're also going to help us get better and move forward. So I think this is an important question to ask yourself when you're filling a specific position, what am I looking for here? Am I looking for someone to continue what we're doing or am I looking for someone to um, enhance what we're doing or change what we're doing in a positive way? All right, then we get to the fun part, right? Making the job offer. Um, I had a colleague I used to work with who used to love to torture people when he was going to offer them a job, but he would call and, and sort of say, hi, I'm calling about the job you applied for, and then tell them they got it. Um, I think that it's, to me, this is the start of their employment, right? So when you call to offer someone a job, give them everything they need to succeed in the job, right? So of course, you're going to give them their salary and when you'd like them to start, you're going to work that out. But any other details they need to be successful on their first day, let's share that with them ahead of time, right? So they come in ready and excited about their first day, right? But that's the, that's the easy part. Offering the job is the easy, the fun part. Telling a candidate no can sometimes be difficult, especially if, if they're really close. Um, so we've got a few rules that we um, adhere to. Uh, we like to respond within one week of the interview right? Don't leave people hanging. You know how um, nerve wracking it can be to interview for a job. And as Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part, right? As you sit there and wait, it can really drive you nuts. Um, after screening, um, so if you screen someone, just sort of, you look at their resume, it's not going to work out. Or if you've had a brief phone screen with them, we send a no thanks email to them uh, to let them know that we're not moving forward in the process. Um, again, we try to do that as soon as possible. Don't leave people waiting. Maybe they're looking at other jobs and they want to be able to move on. If we take the time to have someone come in for an interview, we ask our hiring managers to at least have a phone conversation with them. And again, we see this as providing great service. They've spent the time to prepare, come in, speak with you. The least we can do is, is speak to them um, in kind. Um, when you call someone, get to the point, be brief. Um, you don't want to make this a 15 minute conversation. It should be closer to a 30 second conversation. Um, and I would say, be careful. Sometimes folks really want detailed feedback. And this can also be a place that folks can get into trouble if they haven't prepared in the moment. Um, I like to encourage our hiring managers, if someone wants specific feedback, make an appointment so you can follow up with them and be prepared for that conversation. Uh, because sometimes um, you, you might just say something off the cuff that you didn't quite mean, and it can lead to legal trouble down the road. That's good advice. I remember one time when I was at the roadhouse and needed to tell somebody, no, I knew it was going to be a difficult conversation. So I did a role play with one of my coworkers, <laughs> and I asked them to be really difficult as I told them they didn't get the job. And it was actually helpful. And then the person yeah. that I did call was way less yeah. intense than my coworker was. And so I felt very prepared, but it really, I think practicing helped me not get in the weeds because uh, I kind of knew what, what to expect a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's not fun to give bad news and, and you're right. Doing a little practice can really be helpful and you get better with time. You know, I've said no to a lot of people at this point. I'm probably good at it. It's not a skill I love to have, but it's probably helpful. <laughs> That's excellent. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for walking us through those slides and for bearing with me as there was that glitch. Thank you, oh, Paul. Absolutely. Emily has told me we have lots of questions in the chat. So I think I'll stop sharing the screen so we can see all of us, or at least Paul and I and Emily, and we'd love to hear your questions. Yes. Yes, I would love to get those for you. We have had a very lively chat and Q&A. So let me start asking some questions here. Okay. Um, Isabella asks, uh, regarding writing skills, do grammatical errors, for example, show a lack of attention to detail? Yeah, you know, I think there's an argument to be made there, but sometimes it's just that someone doesn't have that knowledge. So you need to decide whether it's relevant or not to the job. Okay, great. That's a good, short, but sweet answer. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we have an ask a question here. If you can tell that someone struggles uh, with written communication based on their cover letter and resume, uh, an effective communication is important to the job. Well, this sort of it gets to what you just said, but is yeah. it discrimination not to move on with them? Yeah, so if it, if it matters for the job, if, if writing samples matter and attention to detail really matters, Absolutely, we'll, we'll have candidates uh, that we eliminate from consideration because of their cover letter if there's a ton of grammatical errors, yeah. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, how, how do you attract the right talent or candidate that fits the role in the culture? We have many candidates applying, however, the, uh, the interview to offer rate is very low. Mm. Yeah, well, that's a hard one. Um, you know, one thing that I love to do is think about the people that you've hired that have worked out really well mm -hmm. and go back to them and, and ask some questions about their interview process or the recruiting process for them. You know, where did they come from? What, what worked for them? Uh, we can learn a lot from our success stories rather than, um, you know, looking at, at things like hiring rate or number of applications. Um, go back to what worked in the past. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, okay, we have a question here. Is it important to include, include the pay scale? Uh, we don't want to attract the wrong candidates. I think it's absolutely important to include the pay scale. Um, folks wanna know, they wanna know what it is. Um, and yeah, if, if your job is pays 50,000 and someone's looking for 100,000, you hate to waste their time, right? It, I see it as bad service. If someone, takes an hour to put together a resume and apply for your job that they would never take because the salary doesn't match up for them, then you've kind of, you've wasted their time and your time. So it's bad service to them and it's bad service to you. I would 100% recommend including the pay scale on all jobs. Yeah, I will say from my own job searching uh, in, the, in the past, I've had that frustration. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of makes you think like, what are they, you know, I don't know, it, it gives off a, an interesting vibe. Um, okay, so what happens if someone does their job but doesn't match the culture? How are firing decisions made? Well, yeah, that's a tough one because it's it depends on the person, depends on the situation a lot. Um, I strongly believe in the idea that you should hire slower, fire faster. Um, now, that's not to say we don't want to give people opportunities, and and we absolutely give people opportunities. But if you know early on that this was a terrible decision, you want to cut ties as soon as you can, because the longer that terrible decision continues in your organization, the more it's going to cost you to replace that person once again. Um, so, you know, you should have some sort of progressive discipline process in your organization. I'm sure that you would follow. Um, oftentimes during an orientation period, you would have an opportunity to cut people a little bit quicker. So I guess it depends on sort of the expectations in your organization. But to me, the most important thing is that if you recognize on day two, boy, I blew it. This person is not going to work out. Make that decision as quick as you can. While still being kind, of course. Yes. Yes. There was, I remember just in the roadhouse 10 years ago, again, very different hiring market, lots of applications. There was kind of just the running commentary or joke that it was hard to get hired at Zingerman's, but it was even harder to get fired from yeah. Zingerman's because we, we, we weren't great at the discipline process or having a system around it or having those tough conversations when we needed to, when they weren't meeting expectations. And it took a while to, to shift that. Uh, well, we pride ourselves in, in giving people chances and second chances yeah. and third chances. 
Um, and there's something to be said for that. And it, you know, I don't want that to come off as sounding cruel that we want to cut ties quickly, but from sort of a business perspective, it's better for your organization to move quicker when you know for sure. Um, I would also say that I've heard people at times in this labor market say, we just need somebody. We need, you know, we should, our interview question should be, do you breathe oxygen? And they say, yes, let's hire them. But there's a danger to that, right? Because if you start filling roles with the wrong people, it can really have a negative effect on your culture and your organization. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, Joanne wonders, why would uh, you list non-essential functions on the job listing? Yeah, you don't have to. I think it enhances sort of the description of the job. I think I mentioned in my notes that think of it as sort of a marketing opportunity and a way to describe things that are unique or um, opportunities that could come about within the job that aren't necessarily part of the job right? Um, doing this webinar on my job description would be a good non-essential job, right? It was a, it's an opportunity to go and do something a little bit different. Um, so think of it as a way to enhance your job, script, job description, not as a sort of necessary part. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Uh, do, you, uh, do we pay fees to Indeed? Or do we only use free listings? When we we mostly we mostly use free listings. We occasionally will pay to boost the ad to have it sort of be at the top of a job search. Okay. And I've had mixed results with that. I honestly, I'm not sure that it's worth the money in a lot of cases. Um, but I guess and talk to your Indeed rep to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, okay, Megan wants to know if uh, you have any tips on staff retention and engagement. Boy, that's such a good one. It's, a, it's such a good question. And it's so easy for us, especially when it's hard to find staff to just focus on the hiring part. Um, I, I don't have a great suggestion other than to say, if we would spend more time on staff retention, we would not have to spend so much time on recruiting and hiring, right? So don't forget about those people that are doing a great job. Um, I've spoken to some hiring managers that have done what are called stay interviews. And I think stay interviews are a great idea where you approach um, your staff, especially your high performing staff and interview them on what is it gonna take to have you stay here for the next X period of time, one year, five years, whatever. Um, so my only advice is don't forget about the folks you have that are doing a great job. I love that, a stay interview. Yeah. That's really neat. That's really, really neat. They're um, fun. They're really fun, Emily, and you're going to find that staff love them. Yeah. Well, it goes, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So it's the employees yeah. who are leaving and you're putting all your focus on, on more of the toxic or more of the, the trouble employees. The ones who are just doing a great job learning from them. I think that is a great way for learning about staff retention is, is just asking them. We yes. can assume what it is that is making people want to stay working for us, but really just talking to them, that alone, I think, makes them want to stay and you learn what their driving force is or their driving yeah. motivator. Absolutely. A great yeah. tip. That's a really, really good tip. Uh, John wants to know if you have any suggestions or ideas for recruiting part-time variable schedule team members. Ooh, yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one to fill. Um, you know, being real clear about what those hours look like. The thing that's funny about folks that have um, that fit into roles like that is there are people that are looking for if you have a really weird, variable, crazy schedule. There's someone out there who wants that schedule. Like there's someone who wants to work 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. on Wednesdays only. I don't know why, but they, there is. So, you know, being real clear, and that goes back to the job description and the job posting, being real clear about the hours um, and just sharing those, you're going to find someone who wants that um, inevitably. It might be hard, but you're going to find somebody. Yeah. Early morning, morning uh, early birds. <laughs> early birds, late at early. night. That's true. It depends. Yeah. Some want to work weekends, some don't. Right. Right. 
Uh, Heather asks, how long do you recommend continuing to follow up if a candidate is unresponsive to your reach out after you, um, after initial interview? Yeah, um, I would say we usually do two tries and then we move on. Um, I would say, you know, being willing to try different ways to contact someone is important. I think um, the younger the candidate is, the less likely they're going to be to reply to an email and they may want a text message. So if you're collecting their um, cell phone info, try texting someone for that next step. Maybe that works better. Don't assume that they don't want the job just because they don't respond the first time. And I know it is just, it drives you nuts when people don't respond or if you schedule an interview and they don't show up. I totally understand that frustration. Um, keep trying and try different methods. I know uh, one hiring manager here who I think I saw on this call has had great success texting candidates and just that's the way he communicates with people and has been really successful with that. I think that's a great tip for giving great service too, is figure mm. out, well, you know, our first step to great service is figure out what the customer wants. In this case, the customer is the applicant. Yes. Figure out how they want to be communicated with. I mean, asking them, would you like a text message or a phone call or, or an email? You get to know them a little bit differently. And yeah, you can reach them the way that they want to be reached. You know, it's not a question we have on our application, but it could easily be, yeah. um, how would you like us to communicate with you? Yeah. 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 That's a great thought. Plus with chat, with text, you can use emojis. <laughs> could be a whole emoji protocol uh, <laughs> job. confetti <laughs> exactly exactly um julius asks do you have any resources for legality in interviews i think you touched on that a little bit yeah i could look for something that I, i'd be happy to send you uh julius um i i don't have one handy right here but I, i'd be happy to to find something for you find a resource we can link it with Emily to send in the follow-up for the okay. webinar as well, if you, if you come across some things. Yeah. That'd be great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Julius, for that question. That's a great, great question. question. Cody asks, uh, should everyone doing the interview be using prescripted questions or just the HR rep? No, everyone should have the same interview guide. Um, it can be really interesting sometimes if, let's say, Joni and I are interviewing someone and we both are taking notes. It might be interesting what we sort of recorded from someone's response and comparing that afterwards can be really effective. You know, this is what jumped out to me. Uh, so no, I would recommend anyone who's doing an interview should have a written interview guide in front of them. Okay, great. Here's a timely question from Terry. Um, I, is vaccine status an appropriate interview question at Singerman's? That's a, a great question. Uh, so the legality of that is you can ask someone their uh, vaccine status. If they say, no, I'm not vaccinated, you should not ask about why, the why they are not vaccinated. Um, so if it's important for you to collect that information and you know more and more, depending on government regulations, it might be to just have the knowledge, are you vaccinated or not? Um, what you don't want to get into is a big discussion about sort of political philosophy or whatever else in the why. So avoid the why, but you can ask the um, um, yes or no question. Okay, that's great. Good to know. A uh, few questions about shadow shifts and wondering, do, we, uh, do you pay people for their shadow shifts? Yeah, so the, the line between um, pay or not pay for that is as soon as someone provides a service or product that you sell or benefit from, then you should be paying them. Right. So if I have someone come in and I want to see if they know how to set a table, if I then seat a customer at that table, I've got to pay them because they've done work for me. Right. If I have them set the table and I say, great, this looks great. And then we take everything away and no one sat there, then I don't need to pay them. Um, we'll do both at Zingerman's. Um, I encourage people to do shadow shifts because I, I think it avoids you having to do a whole bunch of onboarding paperwork for someone who you might not keep. So my preference is a shadow shift where they're not providing products or services to the public. But to answer your question, we do both occasionally. It depends on the role. Great. Great, great, great. Uh, another question here. We've got lots coming in. Um, let me while I just navigate. 
Uh, how Samantha wants to know, how should you respond if the candidate asks why they didn't get the job? Yeah, I'd be really careful about giving specific feedback. My, my go-to is we chose someone who thought we thought was a better fit for the position. Um, even if you say we chose someone who's more experienced, you know, that's something that can be measured. And if they wanted to sue you or something, they could look into that. So one, make sure you're not saying anything untrue, right? Um, be kind, but you don't want to give them a real specific um, feedback answer. Okay. And I know that doesn't always feel great, but it's just, there's a risk. Once you start going down that path and giving specific feedback, there's a risk to your organization. That's good to know. Do you have a sense for when you're, um, how often people ask why? Is it, is it often or? It's less than you think because I think sort of the disappointment. So when you call someone, there's that disappointment and, and they're not thinking about anything else. I tend to get the question after the phone call and they'll follow up by email. Like they'll say, thanks for calling, let me know. You know, I was just wondering what, you know, what could I have done better? What could I have done differently? Um, and so you gotta have to, I guess you have to feel out that situation as best you can. Um, be careful not to give too much feedback, I would say. That's, that's good. That's a good point here. Uh, Kayleen asks, my company is in the grocery business and we have been struggling in finding candidates for specialty positions such as head baker. What have you guys done to fill these types of positions? We're struggling too. The more specialized, the harder it is right now. I mean, the truth is many industries and in the food industry, there are a lot of people that have said, you know what, I'm, I'm done with that. And it tends to be the more experienced people that we've really lost from this industry. Um, so I'm, I'm posting in more places for jobs like that. I am, um, you know, trying to find new sources of places I haven't posted before. Um, for the one that, that you mentioned, um, I would check with culinary schools in your area and try to make connections with them. Even if they don't have students, the instructors know people that can be helpful. Um, but the truth is it's hard right now. Yeah. Ruth wants to know, uh, what about group interviews? Um, I like group interviews to a point. Uh, you don't want to get so many people that you have like this army of people against one that feels very sort of confrontational. Um, but I think having different perspectives in the room at the same time, so you're all hearing the same information and then can discuss what you heard and what it meant to you and how you think this person fits can be incredibly valuable. Um, I, I think you should always have two people in an interview, um, one just to kind of have your back if you need help, um, but also to get multiple perspectives. I don't know what the right number is as far as limiting the, the number of people in an interview. Uh, yeah, so four feels like the limit to me, but I, I guess that can be a personal preference. Yeah, I've been I've been a part of group interviews um, in the past. It's an interesting it's an interesting experience. It's, it's a delicate balance to your point about finding the right number for your for your business. Yeah. Um, Adrian wants to know how do you say no to an internal candidate that's applied for a job? Oh yeah, that's a real hard one. Um, <laughs> with honesty, I would give them a lot more feedback than you would an external person though, because you want to give them the tools how can they get better? How can they get this job in the future? So if it's a promotion or something, let's talk about a plan that we can put together. You wanna to be a supervisor in this department. Here's what I think you're missing right now. This is why I chose so-and-so over you. Let's get you on a path so that the next time this opens up, you can be hired for this job. So to me, it's a very different conversation in that you wanna be super specific and, and share um, the opportunity to get that in the future. I love that. Ryan asks, uh, what do you look for when hiring a trainer? Maybe Johnny, you can- Oh, yeah, that. I'll defer to- <laughs> What do we look for when hiring a trainer? Uh, I mean, put me right on the spot. I, I mean, I think it's a lot of things and we have a job description for it. That could be something that we potentially share out what some of those key things are. Uh, 
and I don't want to get into the legality of is this essential or non-essential, but I mean, it's typically somebody who really enjoys teaching and sharing knowledge and learning from others, uh, passionate about Zingerman's style of service and food and, and many, many other things. Uh, and if you are on our job postings, you may actually see a posting for a trainer in the next few months coming up. I think our managing partner, Katie, is on this webinar, and I hope I didn't spill the beans, uh, but you'll get a chance to see a little bit more about uh, trainer postings if you subscribe to our job postings. Are you, and you're, are you the newest, I mean, newest, I know you've been here a longer, I think you might be the newest Ari trainer. Ariana came on. Oh, Ariana, that's uh, right. Ariana. Um, but we've both worked in the ZCAP yeah. for a long time before we became trainers. Okay. So you know firsthand what that process is like. Yeah. Well, and I worked at a different Zingerman's business and applied to work here and then went through the whole hiring process as well. Uh, and before I moved over to Zing Train, I applied for a different position at our service network and was told, you're not the right fit right now. And so I've been the person who, and as an internal candidate, was told not right now. And just as Paul said, it was very kind, a, a lot more conversation, a lot more set up for the future. And I really appreciated it. because, mm -hmm. And I actually didn't feel bad, which was really nice. Cause I, I mean, I wanted the other job, but I was like, Oh wait, I'm, I still have a really great job here too. So. Yeah. Katie's confirming. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Good going up in the next few months. So thanks yeah. Katie, for, for uh, affirming that. Uh, Megan wants to know what thoughts uh, we have on hiring bonuses. Uh, I can tell you that we haven't, well, that's not true. We've used them a little bit. We haven't used them a lot. Um, I don't know because I haven't, uh, haven't really tried it out. Um, I can't give you information about whether it's been successful for us or not. Um, I know at least one of our businesses offered sort of a, if you're hired and you're here for X amount of time, we'll give you a, a bonus. Um, it's a good thing for me to follow up on. I, I don't have a good answer for you. I think a lot of people are trying a lot of different things. And I would be curious to hear from folks that have used a hiring bonus, how that's worked for you. Yeah, that would be great. You can let us know in the chat. Uh, we have another question here. Do you have suggestions for questions I can ask in an interview that can help determine if an employee is likely to stick around for several years? Mm -hmm. That's, that's like the magic pill. That's the no, I don't. <laughs> I wish. Um, no, I, I think, you know, ultimately asking questions. So we shared some questions that sort of ask people and get to the root of, are they a good culture fit at Zingerman's? So those questions we shared in the slide, those work for us. Um, they may or may not work for you, or you may want to adapt them slightly, but that's the million dollar question. If, if I could answer that, I, I wouldn't be working here. I'd be like giving million dollar speeches around the country. I'm sorry. <laughs> on an island. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm on an island. <laughs> I'm here. Um, Colette says, great info here. Thank you. She's curious about the cost of replacing or losing people. And uh, do we have a calculation for the different levels of staff? Yeah, there is a formula that you can use. Colette, I'd have to um, get back with you on, on how that is done. It, it can be a little bit um, convoluted. Um, and certainly depends on the position, but, um, if, if possible, that'd be something I'd like to follow up with you about Colette. Yeah, Colette, we can include that in the follow-up as well. Um, we have a comment here. Uh, we want people who are willing to learn and develop one another while working. How do you position your message without losing people who are experienced and capable? Oh, so you're saying we want to open it up to folks that maybe don't have the experience. Um, well, I, I think that we share that we're willing to train. We're willing to bring in people that um, don't have um, the experience, but have the enthusiasm and willingness to learn and grow in the position. Um, the, the Zingerman's business that comes to mind for me is Miss Kim, where she's very clear that uh, you know, I'd love for you to have line cook experience, but if you have a willingness to learn, I have a willingness to teach you. Um, as long as you honestly have that capacity, right? You want to be careful that you're not giving false advertisement. If you have the time and um, ability to, to train folks that don't have um, the experience, 
then I'd say so. I think it's a great marketing tool if it's true about your business. Yeah, that's a great, great point. So I realize we are up on the hour at noon. That sure did go by quickly. Thank you, everyone. We still have a, several questions here and we can, we can get answers to the folks who ask those in the days to come. I am gonna wrap things up for us. Um, so I wanna thank you everyone for joining us today and for asking some really great questions. Um, I wanna give a quick personal note here. Uh, about myself and for future webinars. I've been hosting these webinars for the last four and a half years, and this is my last webinar I'm hosting. So I'm so glad I could spend it with you, Joni and Paul. Um, it's been one of my very favorite parts of my job. I love it. It's so great to be able to chat with people in real time um, and spend an hour with you all virtually each month. Um, so our, but our webinars aren't gonna be going anywhere. So our new community builder, Katie Alexander, is going to be picking up the torch for me next month. And she will be joined by our new digital marketing manager, Alice Rolf Chin. So you'll see some new faces next month. We're really, really excited for you to meet them. If you haven't already, I'm gonna wrap things up. I just wanna thank you both. I wanna thank Mara for rocking it out in the chat. Thanks, Mara. Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts. So Mara, speaking of the chat, do you mind dropping a link to the survey, our webinar survey to let us know what you thought, what we could do better? Um, I know we had some technical glitches today. Thank you everyone for bearing with us. This is just the nature of the real time, real -time training. Uh, we're gonna be sending out a recording to you in the days to come, as well as a link to that survey. So be sure to look out for those in your Emily, inbox. Emily, oh, yeah. if I can just interrupt in a public kind of forum, thank you for all you have done for Zing Train. All of these folks who are typing into the chat, somebody said, we've never met, but I feel like I know you. Like, I think it's so true. Your energy and enthusiasm and passion for what Zing Train has done and all the people we get to work with for the past four and a half years, you are going to be greatly missed. So thank you for everything. Thank and you, I'm glad we could do this last webinar, Me glitches too. and all together. Me too. I kind of like it that way. We're going out, we're going, I'm going out with a bang here. This is, this is, uh, I'm sorry for everyone for that, but it's memorable. It's memorable. It and just to Paul, thank you, Paul, for your experience and expertise and knowledge. And I feel like we have another four hours we could spend together. So easily. No. Yeah. My you, pleasure. Thank you. No. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thank you.